presentation here at stage three is about crowdsourcing. And as you might know, crowdsourcing was one of the big buzzwords of the last years, accompanied by many hopes for more democratic products and better working environments. Um, our speaker, Florian Alexander Schmidt, um, who is a researcher, journalist and designer, will give us a critical evaluation of that concept. Please welcome him with an applause. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, so I will speak about the good, the bad and the ugly of um, crowdsourcing design. And um, the title is meant in a... Um, can be read in two ways, so it's about the crowdsourcing of design work, but also about the way crowdsourcing platforms are designed as systems. And um, for full disclosure, I have a background in design, but at some point um, I turned more towards writing, and um, so in a way I switched from one um, precarious form of freelancing to another one. Um, so. Um, I'm quite familiar with, um, let's say, free labor, and um, in a sense, this is, um, as a speaker here, you also um, work as a free laborer, you're not getting paid, but it's still something very different. And um, I feel the same way about writing, because um, you have the chance to, to bring your own position across and nobody tells you what to do. And that's an important difference to crowdsourcing, which is defined by you following a brief, someone else telling you what to do. Um, so I want to start my presentation with um, a short um, piece of concrete poetry. No worry, it's not written by me. Um. Buy it, use it, break it, fix it, trash it, change it, mail, upgrade it, charge it, point it, zoom it, press it, snap it, work it, quick, erase it, write it, cut it, paste it, save it, load it, check it, quick, rewrite it, plug it, play it, burn it, rip it, drag it, drop it, zip, unzip it, lock it, fill it, call it, find it, view it, code it, jump, and lock it, surf it, scroll it, pose it, click it, cross it, crack it, switch, update it, name it, read it, tune it, print it, scan it, send it, fax, rename it, touch it, bring it, pay it, watch it, turn it, leave it, stop, format Okay, as probably many of you have recognized, this is a piece by Daft Punk um, from 2005. And um, I find it quite interesting because it's about all these tiny micro tasks that we do all the time on the computer. And um, the idea or the rhetoric surrounding Web 2.0. You remember in the old days, in 2000, 2006, was that um, the new web will be about making these small contributions of the millions of people matter and to um, wrestle the power from the few and um, to um, have an empowerment of the user. And um, I argue that um, this hope hasn't... Um, paid out or was an illusion to some extent and um, maybe an illusion that I also fell for and um, I think the reality is more like this. So you had the old media before 2000, like TV stations and so on, um, sending out their uh, content to many recipients and then the idea of Web 2.0 was that you don't have these few senders anymore but only the community that is helping each other for nothing and um, crowdsourcing works exactly the opposite way so it's taking the contributions from the many and privatizes them again so the direction has reversed and um, in my research um, I look at also at older models of um, how computers and people connect in regard to work. And I'm quite interested in these older visions of people like JCR Licklider and especially Douglas Engelbart, um, who had a very utopian idea of how labor could be organized with the help of the computer. You know, it was very much user-centered and it was very much about empowerment. And, um, I think that what we experience today um, is quite distant from these old visions. And um, I'm also interested in 
the structure of power in these systems and um, the, how, are, how they are constructed with the help of computers. And um, this illustration is from 1965 and um, it's about um, the introduction of um, punch cards in the university. And you have this hierarchic structure with capitalists sitting on the top and um, then in the end the university machine is um, putting out these students in form of punch cards. And um, the, the slogan was, don't spindle, um, bend or mutilate me. And um, to jump uh, forward to what's happening now, um, this is a commercial um, for one of the big um, crowdsourcing platforms for design. And the interesting thing is that, again, you have very much the similar structure with all these little humunculi, basically, um, in this hierarchic structure and somebody at the top um, sitting at the desk controlling everything. But this time this is not meant as a criticism, this um, graphic, but as an advertisement for these platforms. And so I'm quite interested in what happened between here and um, there, essentially. And um, the point, of course, is that here the advertisement says that you can be the guy on top of the pyramid um, letting other people work for you. And um, I'm also interested in how the crowd is represented and um, how, um, the how, for example, are the similarities in these book cover designs where you always have these small people running around doing something, but you really don't have the feeling of the empowerment of the user anymore. Another interesting aspect about the crowd is how the term has shifted over time. And so, so the crowd used to be something like an unruly force, like the rebel in the streets, um, something powerful but uncontrollable and um, very much alike to a mob. And um, this notion of the crowd has changed a lot after the turn of the century, basically. And um, if you look at um, older scholars of the, or like the classic scholars of the crowd, um, especially like um, Gustave Le Bon, the guy on top in the middle, um, they introduced the concept of crowd psychology because they, like the spectra, spectrum, um, spectra of um, democracy was haunting Europe basically, so the people got more power, political power, and so the question was how to control um, the people, how to control the crowd, and um, was continued by people like um, Sigmund Freud and um, Freud and Le Bon um, agreed on the point that when a human joins a crowd, he um, descends several rungs um, on the ladder of evolution and becomes something animal-like and primitive and um, definitely um, powerful as, a, as part of the crowd, um, but also um, very um, destructive. And um, interestingly, that has completely turned. So the crowd now is not seen as destructive anymore, but as productive and very um, guidable. And um, I find that quite interesting. And also, um, another um, change in the notion is that um, when this whole Web 2.0 thing was um, gathering speed, um, maybe eight years ago, there was a lot of discussions revolving around the question of quality. So the argument was that, oh, all these um, exuberant monkeys um, are only producing trash and, and we have to protect mainstream media from the, um, uh, from the cult of the amateur and we have to um, reinstall the gatekeepers who stop people from producing all this trash. But I think that um, this argument is also gone. So, so um, it has become clear that the crowd very, is very much productive indeed and can produce quality. And all the trash doesn't really matter if you, if you can search and, and extract the, the value in, in what the crowd produces. So what is crowdsourcing? Um, I really like this illustration of Tom Sawyer who um, managed to get the crowd, or in this case his friends, to do 
the work he was supposed to do for him for free. And, and so crowdsourcing is a lot about this question of how you can get a job done by other people. And it's a lot about making this job look very attractive. And um, in this Mark Twain um, story, he managed to even get paid with like sweets and stuff for because but because it, he made it appear so great to be so, and so difficult and attractive to be allowed to paint the fence. And um, crowdsourcing is really um, a, a method of production um, that um, where, where that is perceived in two very opposing ways. So there are those people who really push the concept and who think that the whole economy has to move more towards the crowdsourcing direction because um, as the argument goes, we as a society on a global scale deal with such great problems, especially environmental issues always come up that we have to all work together and that we cannot trust the polit politicians and so we have to organize and, and all work together to um, create a new s a civilization and to fix a broken world. So that's the rhetoric and um, that says we can replace politics with wikinomics in a way. So that's the pro side and um, the opposite side um, surprisingly comes from Jimmy Wales, for example, who says that crowdsourcing is a vile way to look at the world and it's a business model that tricks people into working for free. And um, that might be a little bit surprising from that side, but um, the important difference between something like Wikipedia, where people also work for free, and the typical crowdsourcing model is that on Wikipedia, for example, people help each other and what they produce is beneficial for even many more people than do the production. While in crowdsourcing the results are privatized and um, only, usually are only beneficial for those people um, doing the crowdsourcing process. So it's an extraction of um, knowledge, of content, of, of, of labor basically. And um, but this, um, this confusion about what crowdsourcing is goes back really to um, the guy who invented the term because he came up with two opposing definitions. One he called the white paper version, which I very much agree to. There are so many other definitions of crowdsourcing, but I find this one quite astute. So he says it's a job that was traditionally performed by employees and that is then outsourced to the crowd basically. So this notion of outsourcing is very important. And his other definition that I strongly reject is that it's the application of open source principles um, to everything else. But as um, this slide showed, open source works differently. So, so it's beneficial for many people. People are self-controlled there in the term of uh, Kevin um, Christopher Kelty, um, a recursive public in the sense that they determine the conditions under which they work and um, they don't follow a brief, they don't do what someone else tells them to do. Um, to make clear that this connection to labor was right there from the beginning, that was meant to be, the term was meant to, to um, refer to that, is um, that um, Jeff Howe, who introduced the term, uh, said it's the new pool of cheap labor, um, everyday people using their spare cycles to create content and so on for free. So um, one important point therefore is that crowdsourcing is about labor or crowd work. I, um, I think the term digital labor is very important. It's a term coined by Trebor Scholz. And if you, if you look for that term, you find a whole different um, a culture of discussion than if you look in the typical innovation and management literature who strangely avoids the term work or labor. It's all about how to get better ideas and how to um, uh, foster innovation and so on and um, they never mention that it's labor essentially and I think it's important to, to, to point to the fact that it's about work. 
And uh, so the question um, that I'm interested in and that my research is basically about is can crowdsourcing be organized in a way that is fair and sustainable for all stakeholders? And um, it's a tricky question because there are so many different crowdsourcing platforms or projects and they are all a little bit different or quite substantially different often. And um, they are now like crowdsourcing.org, which sees itself as like the hub for the industry, they list over 2,000 crowdsourcing platforms. So it's very tricky to, to, um, to capture the problem with such a variety. Um, and what I'm trying to do is to, to map this field. And um, I have, um, I'm working on this, um, on this map at the moment. It's not done yet, um, but uh, the gray areas and these arms are the crowdsourcing in like a broader definition, how some people use the term. And um, I would argue that crowdsourcing in the narrow sense is only these uh, more red um, bits. Um, and um, so, for example, um, data mining, which is also taking something from the crowd, all kinds of input, doesn't um, require a brief, so people do something anyway, and what is being swept up is basically the exhaust of what people do all the time, so, so there's not this element of a brief. And in user-generated content, for example, like on YouTube and so on, people also don't follow a brief, they create their own YouTube videos and so on, um, and, and um, they are the directors of what they produce. It's being swept up also and, and um, nurturing the profit of Google and so on, but it's still something different than crowdsourcing in the narrow sense. I don't go into every aspect of that now, but I want to focus on, on these more narrow um, forms of crowdsourcing. And as you um, saw with the Tom Sawyer example, so the question is, how do you get other people to do work for you? And how do you get them to do your work instead of doing common space peer production things like Wikipedia, for example. Because, of course, people are very happy to work for free because it's intrinsically motivating. And that's especially true for creative work. People, people like to um, work on tricky problems. People like to have the exposure with, for their creativity. Um, people like to get the experience through work. So there are many reasons, good reasons to work for free, but there, are, you, there needs to be an extra reason why you work for free for someone else. And so to make it a little bit more clear, I think you can first of all divide the world of crowdsourcing into unpaid and paid work. And um, the unpaid form occurs in, in implicit crowdsourcing, where you do work without even really realizing it and volunteer crowd work where you donate your work because you believe in a cause even if it's for someone else. And the paid part of crowdsourcing can again be subdivided in cognitive piecework or microtasking or Akkordarbeit in German where you, um, where you essentially um, get paid for every little bit you do or in contest-based crowd work where you um, get paid um, in a lottery system, you have to win to get paid. And over all that, there's a layer of gamification, which gets more and more important, because it gives people incentives that are not money, but where they, um, where they get credit points and um, occur on leaderboards and get all kinds of badges, uh, badges and achievements instead of a payment. But often these concepts are combined. So the point about gamification is that even though you are spending a lot of ti your time and you, you're putting a lot of effort in, you don't have the feeling that you are losing something, but you have the feeling that you are constantly making progress, that you're constantly getting better, that you are rising in the hierarchy of the platform that you are working on. So, so like real-world examples are like the employee of the month, but also all these like bonus point systems and so on. So um, this is a thing that occurs now in crowdsourcing a lot. To um, show you the implicit crowdsourcing, you all know these captures, and I don't go too much into that, but um, many of you will know that, that when you fill those out, um, 
you're also helping Google translate stuff or recognize um, unreadable text or um, recognizing numbers of houses for Google Street View and so on. So you're doing labor without really noticing it or you want to do something else, but this is a side effect that you work for someone else. It could also be discussed if Facebook is implicit crowd work because um, also there you produce something for someone else. But um, so as many people count that in, I'm a little bit skeptic of, of that. So um, uh, Nicholas Carr came up with the term sharecropping. I find that um, quite suitable. Um, if you have a look at volunteer crowd work, um, you, like the most famous example in Germany, I guess, is um, Gutenplug, where um, you uh, had a large crowd working on discovering the plagiarism of um, Karl Theodor. And um, so people um, put in their work time because they believe in this goal of taking this guy down, basically. Mm, but it's still some, nothing where the crowd really has a use of what they produce, in the sense. A very recent example is um, TomNerd, where they um, scan, um, where, where they um, outsource to the crowd the, the, um, the analysis of satellite images, in this case, to find um, this missing plane. And um, I think it's eight million people who contributed to that. And um, of course, it's amazing that so many people are willing to, to invest their time for such a goal. So um, it's not all... Um, Grim. Um, but there's another side which is about the outsourcing of surveillance, which I find quite um, problematic. So um, this project um, just stopped because it was, it was ineffective, but it was running for a few years. And the idea was that you could watch the Texas border and prevent immigrants from illegally crossing the border. And people were doing this from their home. You have the same thing in the UK with Internet Eyes, where they try to crowdsource um, shoplifters and you could watch the surveillance cameras from small shops. And what is still um, active or um, is this um, project, it's called Face Watch ID, it's also by the British police and um, it's about, you, you basically enter your postcode and then you can see if you might be able to recognize criminals in your neighborhood um, from your iPhone. And um, so I just put this up to say that this Volunteer, volunteering doesn't always necessarily mean that it's, that it's good. I mean, of course you can argue this is to reduce crime, but, but still. Okay, the paid crowd work, which is the more relevant form of crowd work, I think, um, as I said, falls into cognitive peace work as one category. And um, you um, might know Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is the platform where now 500 people are working on. And they do these small tasks like recognizing stuff, um, uh, organizing databases and so on. And um, they get like very tiny amounts, like a cent or so for everything they do. And um, they come from 190 nations and um, supposedly there are 10,000 people on Amazon's Mechanical Turk at any given moment um, toiling away. And um, the problematic thing, or one of the problematic things about um, Mechanical Turk is that um, these workers are quite, quite invisible and there's a very strong information asymmetry between um, those giving out the work and those having to do it. And so, for example, the people who are letting the crowd work for them, they can take the work of the crowd but still say, oh, it was bad, we don't want it, um, we don't pay anyone afterwards, after they have taken um, the work, which can be regarded as wage theft in a sense. And, um, but the other important thing is that outside of India and the US, so in the other hundred and 88 countries that are working on Mechanical Turk, Amazon is paying these workers only in vouchers. So if you want to get your money from your work, you have to pay, buy your stuff in the factory shop. So you're getting um, basically um, a disadvantage again. 
And but but the strange thing is that if you look into the forums of these platforms, um, the workers, even though they make as little as maybe one dollar forty an hour or so, um, if they are not experienced, and this goes up to maybe like five dollars or so, if they are really experienced, um, these workers. Um, don't want any regulation of their work because they fear that the little money that they make there will break away if, if um, uh, legislation um, gets in there. So, so people in a way want to get exploited there because they are so dependent on this work um, because of the um, general economic um, situation. And this is clearly not crowd work that people do in their free time just for fun but people are really trying to make and ends meet with this type of work and um, there are programs that try to build on mechanical turk and use the api basically so for example this is soylent it's a research project by the mit um, where they have the idea that you have like a plug-in in your word processor where you can then just, if you write a text, you can choose a paragraph and then give it to the crowd and they correct it or condense it or, or do um, different formatting with it. And you pay a little bit um, for this service. And um, what I find problematic about this is that the people that work for you completely disappear in the interface. So you don't have any human relationship anymore. And also, I mean, the name is quite grim. I don't know how many of you know, but there's this film, Soylent Green, um, which is about an overcrowded world where at the end it becomes clear that, that the, the nutritious snack that everybody's living on is made of people. So it's quite uh, cynical to name it this way. And um, I think it's meant as a joke, but still you have to take into consideration that this is the design of a work environment for thousands of people. So um, um, they are not taking into consideration when you when you design such a work environment. There is um, there are projects um, that try to um, do something against this information asymmetry, like for example Turcopticon, which um, is a plugin for Firefox that allows the um, workers to see which um, which employers um, tend to not pay the workers or treat them badly because Amazon does not include these informations for the worker so these systems are really designed in a way that the workers don't have any um, like good user experience or any um, control over what, the, what they are doing um, and uh, this is one plug-in that tries to, um, to give uh, more power to the workers, at least in sense of knowledge. Okay, for the rest of the talk, I will speak about the crowdsourcing of design, because this is what I'm especially interested in. And um, an interesting aspect about this is um, that Jochai Benkler, the guy who came up with the term common space um, peer production, pointed out that if the granularity of the task is um, very high, so if the individual tasks are very small, like on Mechanical Turk or on um, all kinds of other platforms, the incentive um, becomes trivial. So, so if you if you don't if the if the task you do is very tiny and you do it on the side a little bit, then you um, you don't expect much to earn from that. But with design solutions, you cannot do that. It it um, you cannot fine-grain it to the extent that you, for example, can do data input. Input. So you have to work a few hours to create a design. And so you cannot pay the workers for every click they do. That's why you need the contest system. And um, I will let one of those big platforms in the field, 99designs, um, who have about 300,000 registered designers working for them, explain their business model um, to you. Welcome to 99designs, the number one marketplace for crowdsourced creative design. What makes 99designs different? With 99designs, you get dozens of designers to work on your project. We help you host a design contest, where a crowd of designers compete to give you the design you love or your money back. 
Here's how it works. Tell us what you need. Logo, business cards, website, or even product packaging. Then tell us how much you'd like to pay. That's right, you decide how much you pay. The more you offer, the more design concepts you'll see. Within hours, designs begin to pour in. After that, tell everybody what you like and what you don't like, so the designers can improve their designs. After seven days, you'll have pages of designs from dozens of designers. Then comes the really fun part. Check out all the designs until you find the perfect match. Rest assured, if you don't get a design you love, we'll give you your money back. 99designs is simply the best way to get graphic design done affordably and with no risk. Already over 50,000 projects have passed through our doors. Now it's your turn. Launch your design project today. So, 99designs um, and similar platforms, they are growing like Topsy. And, and there, um, a few years ago, there was a lot of protest in the design community against these and, and um, attempts to, to say it don't work there and so on. And, and uh, maybe people thought that it might, might go away again. But um, I think this is not going to happen. Um, so 99designs, for example, acquired, um, I think, $35 million venture capital. Um, which is quite substantial, and um, they um, have um, the, pro the point is why it's so attractive for venture capital is because they found a way that they can not only outsource completely the labor without having to pay for it, but also completely the risk. So they are only controlling the, the platform, the stack, so to speak, without doing much and. Um, they, but they take about 40% of um, the money that the clients pay. So if you go there to get a logo done and you pay 400 euro, 99designs takes off 120 euro right away. And then there's 180 euro left for all the designers to compete. And there are about 116 logos that you get for that on average. So the price of a logo falls down to, I think, $1.50 or so. And the chance for you to get paid for your work is then one in 116 or um, something like that. So um, it's very risky for you to, to work in this environment and you have two choices basically. Either you self-exploit yourself a lot and put in a lot of time to get good logos or um, you steal ideas, which many people do in these environments. So it's a lot about like recycling stuff from some kind of, kind of databases, from clip art and so on, which has the effect that on top of the very problematic working conditions money-wise, people are also inclined to rat each other out and saying, oh, user this and this stole this idea from there, and, and so they're posting links where the ideas came from. So, so you have those people trying to game the system by uploading half ready-made designs, and those who put in far too much time, especially because they have portfolio sites on these platforms where all the design that you do there basically falls back on you. So, so you want to have a good logo in your portfolio even if you get not paid for it at all. And um, so that's the reason why in design work people are really inclined to do work that is really, um, they put in much more time than would be economically reasonable. Design Lesson is another platform, it, in, um, a German platform. I just included this to show you the, the ratio in which the most successful people win contests. So the most successful person on that platform, you see, has won about 500 contests, but he participated in 3,000. And um, so that's the most successful guy there. And uh, so in every fifth time, only he gets paid for his work. And if you see the most successful people um, sorted after the success rate, like the more you take part in a way, the, the more realistic it becomes that you lose. So it's like gambling that if you do it sometimes, you might have luck, but if you do it a lot, um, chances are or odds are against you. Um, I included this um, testimony um, because it brings across a few points. It's by a designer from the Philippines and she writes about the spec addic addiction and how addictive is it, it is that you always think you almost won 
um, and then the client says, oh, can you change please this and that, and you do more work and more work, and then again, you still don't win. And so you earn that little money that even for people in the Philippines, um, it can be quite tough, even though they have, of course, much lower living standards or um, costs than we have. So globalization is a very important aspect of crowdsourcing. Um, and here you cannot seriously compete with people with that that less um, living costs, but even for them, then them it's um, difficult. So the big question is, is it exploitation? And how to define exploitation? And of course, there's like this whole Marxist body of theory that argues that basically if... if um, if a value is extracted, um, that does not flow back to um, the workers. Um, if they work longer than they are getting paid for, it's already exploitation. But that makes basically every job exploitation in capitalism. So I really can recommend to read the paper of um, this professor of philosophy who argues that it's really about um, having a fair share in the value that is being extracted. And um, um, we could go back to that in the discussion later. Uh, I will now show a few design, um, crowd design platforms that are, wor that are working different. They are not so outright exploitative, but try to make things differently. So um, Lego Ideas, um, for example, um, gives those who contribute ideas and who make it through a long process, a one year lo long process of gathering contributors for their designs, they, they get a share in the revenue that LEGO eventually makes in this process, which um, of course sounds great, but um, here it's the problem, like on a hit list or so, um, that in, in effect all the products that are if effectively get made in the end are already existing brands. So, um, because for Lego that promises the biggest profit, I guess, and also you can get the most supporters for your idea. So there are more original ideas, like including more female scientists for Lego or playful ideas, but, but the, the things that actually make it to the shelves are usually um, parts of already existing brands like Back to the Future and, and um, Harry Potter and so on and so forth. And, um, and they produce, I think, two or three new products every year. So, so you have to do a lot of work in gathering 10,000 supporters before your product has even a chance uh, that they look at it to produce it. The most successful company at the moment in this field is Quirky. And um, they are quite amazing. They now have 800,000 designers working for them and they develop these products, like household products, usually rather simple but clever ideas for all kinds of stuff. And they also have this evaluation process with the crowd, so, so it's the crowd who pushes things forward and they collaborate on these ideas and the platform tracks who has contributed what to a very fine-grained extent. And so if the product makes it to the shelves and in contrast to Lego, they put out three new products every week that um, then land in 35,000 stores with a very high uh, production rate, they make a lot of money actually. And um, they have this weekly um, um, evaluation processes where the um, 150 employees of the company vote together with the community which projects are going to move forward. And um, Quirky actually is putting a lot of work in there. So the community contributes the ideas and refines them, but Quirky makes real products out of them. They have a lot of product designers working for them. They have the whole infrastructure from Product, from production to the shelves and so they can be very, very profitable and um, can pay a lot back to the crowd. A while ago I made an interview with this guy who developed this um, special wine opener um, and he now earned um, $33,000 um, through the sales and through being part of the, getting a part of the revenues. And... Um, so um, that's already quite substantial. And um, his name and his pictures on the, on, the, um, on the packaging of the product, together with the names of hundreds of other people, 
I think maybe 800 or so who have also influenced this idea and also get like a tiny fraction of the revenue. And um, Quirky, like this is the most um, successful guy on Quirky. He already earned 600,000 um, um, dollar for a very clever um, Steckdose, I don't know what the English word is. Okay, so um, they make a lot of money and also, again, venture capital is pouring in. So they now got 176 million in venture capital um, that they um, like that Quirky, Quirky acquired and they make 18 million in revenue in 2012 and they are still growing very quickly, but they are also still not profitable because they are expanding so much. Another example is Yovoto, it's a Berlin startup and um, they work differently because they, they do campaigns and, and designs for big brands and they um, have large sums of money that the crowd can win in a contest and the crowd also is taking part in the evaluation and, and so it's not a winner takes it all model but um, there are maybe five winners who take sums from like 10,000 euro to maybe five or 2,000, so, so um, depending on if you are the first or the third. And um, they, the, the intellectual property rights, if the company actually tries to produce something um, or wants to produce something, goes forward with it, um, is um, you get paid for that extra. And in contrast to the design logos, uh, the logo design, you don't produce the full product, you produce the idea um, so there's a big difference and um, so they, they really try to organize it as fair as possible and um, so you see um, how the, the pricing is, is organized and plus a licensing, licensing fee and um, so I think they do a lot of things right and they are very aware of um, the exploitation or fairness problem in crowdsourcing. Um, last pl platform that I want to briefly mention is Open IDEO. Um, it's by the big IDEO design corporation, but they they try to circumvent the problem of fairness by only outsourcing um, projects to the crowd that are meant to be for the greater good, and um, and they don't pay the crowd at all. And um, they um, want you to participate because of experience and and um, and because it's 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 uh, socially beneficial. And um, as you see, for example, this design quotient is a good example for the implementation implementation of gamification. So if I work there, for every little bit I do, um, I get points and um, and I. Uh, this is how people on the platform perceive me. So I wear this badge in front of me and of course it's a huge incentive for me to put in extra hour and to, and to rate the designs of the other people and to generally be a nice person because um, this is the currency on the platform, this design quotient. Okay, enough examples. Back to the question from the beginning. So can crowd design or crowdsourcing be designed in a way that is fair and sustainable for all stakeholders and well I think not both I think that examples like your voto show that it can be designed fair in a way that um, the revenues are more fairly distributed and so on but um, still it's not a sustainable model I just came from a talk about freelancing and and there was the same argument there that you cannot work for free if it's your profession and um, it's something like an internship that might make sense in the beginning of your career when you have no experience and so on and you you even then it's problematic but but there might be good reasons why, why you why you decide to work for free but um, but as a as a profession it's really detrimental and problematic I think so so it can be organized the platforms can be designed in a way that is more fair but you always have to take into consideration that there's always a limited budget for the work but if the crowd by definition is unlimitedly large you always have to separate this budget either everyone gets very tiny amount of money or it's a winner takes it all model and um, so that cannot be sustainable if you work for free and um, the, the people around Jovoto, Bastian Unterberg and two other um, guys, they wrote a 
quite a good insightful book about crowdsourcing. They call it crowdstorming, where you can really see that they are aware of the fairness. And so, so the book is pretty good. But what is really disturbing is that they keep referring, referring to um, American Idol, um, which is like the American uh, version of Deutschland sucht den Superstar, or rather the other way around. But um, I think it's, it's, it's horrible to, to have like a working situation where you have this system of everybody competing to everybody against everybody and there's only one winner in the end where there are these production companies in the background that continuously make a lot of money and all this venture capital that is flowing into the area of crowd work shows that people are really um, believe in people really believe in those money people who give the money that they can extract substantially more money out of it over time so um, that really shows that that the system is uh, flawed I think and um, to come back to a picture from the beginning there's this um, a moral philosopher called John Rawls, and he um, has this concept of um, a theory of justice, basically, to evaluate fairness. And um, his, his idea is that if you design a system, those who design it should be in the position, or put them in the mental position, of not knowing in which which position they will later take in the system. Only then it's fair. So if you if you up front have like he calls it a veil of ignorance so you don't know where you land in this system and you certainly don't want to land here but if 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 you don't have a chance to um, when you land there to move up or if you it's, it's basically an unfair system and um, so I think this is an important point of how um, where, where do you put yourself? Do you see yourself in this position of now being able to outsource work yourself, to become an exploiter in a way and, and send stuff to, to uh, developing countries and be in this powerful position? Or do you see the whole system and also the other side? And um, yeah, I mentioned already the point of sustainability and I don't know how many of you yesterday saw the very good talk by Saskia Sassen and she also talked about the erosion of the middle class and the way capital extracts um, resources from a broader and broader um, part of society and I think this is part of what we are also seeing with crowdsourcing and um, there's um, a very good book by um, um, Jaron Lanier who, um, it's called Who Owns the Future? And he also addresses this problem and he says that it's basically what he calls the siren service. Those people who own the structure, who own the stack, who own the platform, who basically get more and more powerful. You see it with Google and with Facebook and so on, while you have like the majority of people who are basically treated as livestock in there. So they are disposable. And... Um, his conclusion, which is maybe worth discussing, is that we should not work for free at all. We should implement a system where everything we do gets paid a tiny amount. And um, so it piles up. So um, the flaw in his system is that this um, demands that we have a, like a total surveillance, that everything we do on the internet is being recorded and then there's like a mechanism where profits are um, distributed according to this total surveillance in a way as you have it on um, as a model on Quirky where also the platform tracks every little contribution that you, makes, that you make. Um, the other model that you come across, especially in Germany, a lot is the idea of a bedingungslose Grundeinkommen, like a, a general basic income, which also sounds tempting, because then, I mean, you, um, if you are if you are paid, you can spend your time as you will on on these like free labor projects and 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 um, experience your creativity and enhance your mastership and so on. I think the the flaw in that, prop in that proposition is that then you really have to even have more strict border control, for example. So you cannot have people, like you cannot have seven billion people moving freely around the world when 
you have a system that is based on the state paying people to have a decent living and not paying them for their work. That's why I'm a little bit skeptical of the um, Grundeinkommen. Okay, I have to um, wrap up now. So maybe one um, idea would be to tax companies that draw so much from the general public very high amounts of money and use that money to redistribute. But um, I also don't think that that's like the final solution or the, the, the perfect idea or so. So I don't have a solution to the problem. My, my mission is more to point out that crowdsourcing is indeed very problematic and that it's not like a fledgling new web phenomenon anymore, but that it has consolidated and is now like a huge industry and that we should aware of the exploitation mechanisms in this industry. And um, if you see the whole thing from the aspect of workplace design, this is really like a neoliberal ideal come true. To, to work on a, in an environment where, um, where you, are, you have total surveillance, you are paid by gamification, everything you do is, is, um, is tracked and, and um, I find it quite dystopian. And um, so um, I think it's important to um, um, stand up against it. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. We have 10 more minutes for questions to you. Are, they, are there any questions in the audience? Thank you very much for your great presentation. Thank you. I have a question about the, um, because you mentioned the Open Ideal platform. And what I find interesting about this platform is, This is about non-profit projects, but if you want to apply for a job at IDEO, they expect you to have an open IDEO profile. So I wonder what you think about the fact, regardless of how these crowdsourcing platforms are designed, especially at the beginning of your career, you need to be participating and you need an online portfolio for which you're not being paid in order to be visible or apply to jobs. It's super interesting that you mentioned it. I don't know, uh, can I ask you back, like, wh sure. how do you know that? Because uh, I keep hearing that, and I think it makes totally sense that it's basically like an externalized internship system, mm -hmm. but it's hard to prove that. Like, have you made this experience, or...? I'm, not, I'm a researcher, I'm not a designer, so okay. I was thinking about applying to design research jobs, but I don't have a design portfolio, and then I thought, I haven't applied because I didn't want to spend months building up a profile yeah. on this platform for free. Yeah. yeah, but I think that this is really the, the, the main motivating factor behind it, but it's hard to, to track that down. But it, the, the time, it, it's super time consuming in contrast to other crowd projects. Because the projects are so complex, you really have to read a lot of what other people contributed. And, and it's, it's very intensive labor, actually, to, to be able to, to keep up with that. Yeah. There are some more questions. Hi, if I understood it correctly, you say that it should be a mix of intrinsic and extrinsic um, incentives that you offer on your platform. I'm a bit skeptical about the intrinsic ones, I have to say, because badges are nice and I personally like it. I go for gamification like that, but um, how would you say you could structure these intrinsic incentives so that it's fun and people go for it and it's you feel like you can do something because you showed the design quotient which you can wear as a badge of honor and you can put it in your CV maybe or something like that. What's your idea of making that good? Well, I think that the intrinsic um, motivation that is really what you, you bring bring yourself. So, so, so I think it's hard to, to, to design that and I think that um, gamification for me is really an extrinsic um, mechanism. Um, but um, you point to a very important thing, the fact that you cannot extract your experience from these platforms and take them anywhere else. So you basically tie to this thing and if you, if you show up with your design quotient by another company who might not know the, um, that platform, you, you, you start from nothing. You cannot really put that in your CV that you worked there for free that, that many times. So, so, so there's a lock-in effect with the reputation that you build up in these platforms. So you think it should be in, in a way where you could 
do that. That that would be a good thing. That you make it something more general, so you can take it and put it in your CV and have it as a reference. That would be a step forward, but I think you should get properly paid and put that in your bank account and take that with you. And um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So I see a question over there. Hi, um, you hinted a bit at the problems with crowdsourcing policing um, or border control. Could you say a bit more about that and where you think the line is with community sharing information? Well, I think that um, it's um, problematic when you outsource um, um, obligations that clearly belong to the state to the crowd to uh, save money and you, because you don't, you, also you don't know what the motivation of people is who um, participate in these surveillance um, uh, projects. Even with the Gutenberg thing, the Gutenplug, um, I mean the motivation of the people, of course someone to defend academia and, and uh, it serves a function, but there's of course also always like a political agenda and, and um, you don't know why people are so keen on bringing that particular person down and you also don't know if they got hinted off by someone else following a political agenda and so on. So I think there are many um, parts of, of, of work um, that should clearly not be outsourced in a way where you don't have any control who is um, participating for what reason. And um, another example is um, Al Gore is doing this uh, project that is called Reality Drop, where he basically crowdsource a fight against climate change deniers, where you have like a gamified, gamified platform where people get credit points when they place arguments again, uh, like that, that show climate change is actually happening into other webs websites and discussion forums and so on. So you might see a comment in a platform that seems reasonable and you don't, are not even aware that this person is not posting this comment necessarily because he or she read the discussion, but he or she gets credit points on some other platform. So it becomes very intransparent what people are motivated by and who, who guides them through gamification, for example. And also, like the, with the state thing, I think you should not pay like headhunting fees or, or gamified bonus point systems for, for tracking down criminals. It, it's, it's like the wild, wild west, so into the wild. Um, it's really like the motto also for that. Yeah. So, are there any questions? Any hands? Over there. Hi, uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Quick question, so in, in crowdfunding, you have some interesting examples of uh, the crowd uh, buying equities and products and get revenue sharing. Do you know of licenses that are kind of designed to the same for where people contribute their skills or insights rather than money into creating a product? So kind of license, licenses for yeah, revenue sharing. Yeah, you have it in Lego and you have it in Quirky. So, so these are two of the big examples, I think, um, where, where you really have part of the revenue. And I think that's quite fair, because the more profit somebody makes with your idea, the more money you also get. And, um, yeah. Great. I have loads of questions, but I'll catch you later. Okay, yeah, do that. All right, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, oh, over there. Uh, there is one more issue about crowdsourcing. If a crowd is doing is solving some really difficult problems, uh, there is some intellectual property IP of the companies and NDA, and it's rather complicated. Companies don't want to give their secrets out, but they want to get problems uh, solved, which uh, are connected with these secrets. How do you think uh, this will work? 
Well, there's a platform, for example, um, a very old platform already, like 12 years old, um, Innocentive. That is uh, where people solve research and development problems for big um, chemical corporations, for example. And there it works the way that um, at least the crowd cannot see the contributions of the others. So it's, it's not visible um, what the others do. And, and so you have some protection that, um, that your idea is not going away. But, but for people, like for inventors, for example, the inventor that I interviewed for, from Quirky who did this wine opening thing, he said that if he has like a really good idea, he first goes to platforms where nobody can seize his idea. Um, and then if, if they, uh, where, where, when the companies reject his idea, then he goes to community platforms where the risk that somebody steals his idea is, is higher, but um, also the chance that it's being developed. So he had like the system of, of going from one platform to the other, um, depending on the level of secrecy. Okay, I fear our time is running up. Okay. Thank you again for this wonderful presentation. I think Thank you, you. Will, you will be available for answers after the talk. Yeah. There will be another crowdsourcing talk in exactly. two hours or so. You will exactly, I'll yeah, moderate that. Okay. We'll have a short break and continue them with the next presentation. Thank you.